All right, Dave Revson is with me. Uh, those of us who know Dave Revson call him Rever. Um, what else do we call you? Uh, the face of the Big Ten Network. <laughs> How are you doing, Dave? I am doing splendidly, Chuck. I'm coming at you from a hotel room in College Park, Maryland. We've got, it uh, looks like we got a little bit of that Maryland flag, that state flag behind me there on the on the wallpaper. So that's pretty cool. Um, we're in the midst of our preseason tour. We go and watch every team go through a preseason practice. So we're four teams in. We see the Terps tomorrow and began our East Coast swing today with Rutgers. So I'm uh, I'm in full football mode, but excited to talk about the Sox as well and, and always thrilled to talk to you. I mean, uh, we obviously have a great history together, which, which perhaps we can get into. But um, but yeah, it, uh, it fires me up to turn on the Sox and, and see you every night. I do that on a very regular basis. Yeah, we met in 1996 and we were starting out at ESPN. I do believe if I uh, if my memory serves, I think not only in the first conversation I had with you, but maybe the third sentence that you said to me, I think you when we found out we were both from Chicago, you kind of sized me up and you just wanted to know if I was a White Sox fan or a Cubs fan. <laughs> yeah, it's the first question I ask everyone who's from Chicago. It's really important information. And at ESPN, we got a lot of good responses, right? I mean, I, it's the first thing I asked Mike Hall, too, when I met him. And, of course, he is a diehard White Sox fan as well. So, yes, it is. It's the first thing I ask any Chicagoan, and I'm a little unusual in that I grew up in the north suburbs, but I'm a White Sox fan. My father was, was a diehard Sox fan and, and um, just loved the team, grew up with them. He grew up on the west side, and I was a vendor at the old Comiskey Park, so you know, deep ties to the team, and, and really those are my first memories as a sports fan are of going to the old Comiskey Park with my dad. So, yes, it is, uh, it is important you responded correctly. And uh, we were able to forge a friendship from there. <laughs> what was it like being in the northern suburbs and being a Sox fan? Because you were uh, definitely in the minority, I assume. I was, although I had a couple of really good friends who were Sox fans also. I say this a lot, and I, I think you would probably echo this sentiment. We were both so bad when we were kids that it didn't really matter, right? I mean, it was kind of... I mean, 77 was a really fun year for the Sox for the first five months or so of the season until it kind of fell apart uh, in August and September. And, and the, so I remember being really excited about the team that year. 75 was, was my first year as a fan. Went to a doubleheader on my sixth birthday, July 20th, 1975, against the Brewers. Those are the first Sox games I ever attended. So, I, but I, I, I don't really think it was, like, it just didn't make that big a difference because... Again, it wasn't like I was rooting for the worst team or they were both they were both bad. Obviously, the Sox broke through first in 83 and then the Cubs followed the next year. But I never really felt like I was kind of in some crazy minority that I had to somehow defend my position against. I mean, you know, I like I'm not, I'm not rooting for the Cubs. OK, you know, like they, they're awful. And, and I also think that Wrigley Field didn't have the same mystique when we were kids that, that it does now, um, I, I feel like that evolved definitely during our lifetime. So, you know, we, I would go to a lot of Cubs games because, um, you know, we were, it was, it was easy to take the L and, and, you know, drop, get dropped off in, in Skokie or Evanston and uh, just, you know, hang out there for the day. My closest friend was a diehard Cubs fan and, and they had first row seats they had had throughout their, um, they'd had them since the forties in their family and they kind of gradually moved up to where they were in the front row behind the opponents on deck circle. And so we'd go to a ton of games and I'd kind of pretend I was cheering for the Cubs deep down inside. I was rooting for the other team. <laughs> How would you describe your White Sox fandom? Like when you, when the Sox win, does it affect your mood when they lose? Does it affect your mood? So a lot less so than it used to. I think 2005 really fulfilled me in a lot of ways. And I realized it was 17 years ago and I get it, you know, but um, as you know, my father was dying at that point, uh, passed away in 2007. And so we were able to go to game two uh, of the world series together, Scotty pods, the walk off home run, uh, walking out uh, into the parking lot afterwards, you know, he, I got the tickets through, through ESPN and, you know, he thanked me and just said it was one of the great memories of his life. Mm -hmm. And so that, 
like having had that Chuck, like that fulfills me as a Sox fan. Now, would I love to see it replicated to be able to share moments like that with my kids? My oldest in particular is a huge Sox fan. She, she loves them. And I, I've, I've written a little bit about uh, my relationship with her and, and the way the White Sox have been a thread through it. Uh, my, my two younger girls are also Sox fans. So would I love to see it happen again? Yes. But um, does it, it annoys me. I mean, like if they have a, you know, this year has been annoying. It's been frustrating. And I will look at Michelle and I'll say, man, the White Sox are frustrating. Right. But does it keep me up at night? It does not keep me up at night the way it might have 20 years ago. Yeah. This has been a trying season. This oh. has been a challenge. And I think it's not just because it's this season, it's the buildup from the last five or six with the rebuild. Yep. We were thinking by 2022, here we go. And all these great teams in baseball, the Sox were supposed to be one of them. And it's been a tease where they'll have like two games or three games where they play well and then nothing. Or they'll score 13 runs in a game and the next day they scored two. <laughs> They're messing yeah. with our emotions. That's what they've been doing. Yeah, they have. And, and I think that's where, I mean, it, I just feel like in baseball and, you, you know, you know, like I remember we were playing golf like maybe four years ago and you were going through the farm system with me and and really, you know, I kind of was asking you, well, tell me about, you know, Michael Kopak, right? And you were going through and explaining some of these guys and how highly touted they were and how good Moncada was going to be. And, you know, kind of go, what, hey, you know, here's where everyone ranks. And, um, and, and so I, I think kind of my frustration is that now this is the time. And I, I know that I'm preaching the choir, right? Like this is your window, the window when you're a franchise like the White Sox, it's not going to be permanently open. It's going to be open for maybe a four or five year period. And you have to win in that time. And then if you don't, you're going to kind of have to start over a little bit, maybe not from scratch in the way that they did five, six years ago, but you know, you're, you're, you're not going to, that window's not going to be open forever. And I think that's what's so frustrating was to go into this year and see you know, power rankings that had them third or fourth in the major leagues and feel like, wow, this could be a special summer. And then to be here we are in the beginning of August and there are two games over 500 and they haven't been better than this since April. <laughs> and it just kind of feels like, I don't know. I mean, I, this you, you feel like this is where they're going to be. They're going to be somewhere between two games over and two games under for the rest of the year, unless something dramatic happens here, unless they kind of put it together and they're healthy. And I think you yeah. know, finally have the lineup that they expected to have at the beginning of the year and, so maybe, but but then there's the frustration of not doing anything at the trade deadline. And so I don't know, Chuck. They they have toyed with our, our, my emotions, not nearly as much as they've toyed with yours. I was saying this to you before. I I think you guys do a really good job. And I saw Jason Benetti last week and said the same thing to him. You know, you do a really good job of sharing the frustration that the fans have, that the people who are watching have, but also I think being really fair and, and being fair to the team. And, and I know that's not easy to do. So Kudos to all of you involved in the broadcast because it's it's really good to watch and and great to watch the the, the post game show as well. And I think you guys are fair when they play poorly, you say it, but but you don't pile on. You just kind of say what the fans are thinking. Yeah, I think what I've learned is you know through this is that teams and success for not just teams but really for players, prospects, success and development isn't linear. We thought, oh, the Yohan Mancata of 2019, he'll just keep getting better and right. better and better. Aloy Jimenez will keep getting better and better and better. And that happens to some to some players in baseball, but most it can be a zigzag. Or these guys are young for any number of reasons. They're not always going to get better and better and better and better. And that's also frustrating because I don't know who Yohan Mancata is anymore. I know he's a very good third baseman. I don't know what kind of hitter he is. I don't know what kind of hitter he's going to become because he hasn't been the Yoan Mankata of 2019 ever since 2019. So um, I, that's where I get frustrated because, you know, this is, these are the guys we thought they were going to be by 2022 and they're not, some are, some aren't. Then you got a story like Dylan Cease who like, Oh, okay. Like he is a Cy Young award contender. Crazy. And He's been amazing. He's like, yeah. he's probably the best story in Chicago. Whoa, hold on a second. Let me think about this. 
is he the best player, best athlete in 2022 in Chicago sports? I'll ask you that. It just kind of popped in my head. Feels like it, right? I mean, it's he's certainly the best success story this year. It's funny because you asked me kind of what my viewing habits are. And again, not to take unnecessary pot shots at anyone, but if Lance Lynn is pitching, I'm not as excited to watch if Dylan Cease is pitching. I'm just not. Yeah. Like if Dylan Cease is pitching, if I can be, I'm there from the first pitch. Uh, and, and yeah, I mean, he's been just thrilling to watch. And and I, I think kind of the frustration is, OK, like I got Cease going and, you know, now it feels like Giolito isn't quite where he was. Yeah. And, you know, the obviously the the injuries in the in the preseason, um, you know, kind of that Derek Crochet is someone I was really excited about heading into this year. And then he goes down. And I mean, injuries have been a huge part of this. And, and I know like in all teams, guys get hurt. But I mean, the White Sox this year has been a little crazy. But then there's a part of me that says, well, you know, are they doing something wrong? Like, why is it they have this just inordinate number of hamstring injuries? Right? It just seems bizarre. Are they... Is there something in their training? And I, I don't know. I mean, all that stuff's frustrating, too. Like, I, again, the window's so narrow for a franchise like this that to see things kind of continually go wrong as a fan, it just gets exasperating. Yeah. I normally, like April and May and even June, I don't get wrapped up in too much of anything uh, because there's it's such a long season. And yep. yeah, they had the injuries and I was making excuses left and right. <laughs> I would say it's freezing in April. They'll get it together. The, the injuries are a problem. They'll get it together. The schedule was not in the White Sox favor whatsoever. I mean, if you notice like all the tough teams other than four games with Houston are behind them. I mean, they have an easy yep. schedule the rest of the way. So, but now they're playing this stretch of 19 games against sub 500 teams. And they've gone seven and five, but they just haven't gone on a run. Once, and I say once to go on a run, they haven't done it yet. Hopefully they will. If they just win, easy for me to say this, 10 out of 12 games, they're in first place. Like that's the kind of run they need to do when they're down, when they're two games back. But will they do it? That's the question mark. And we're here in August and it hasn't happened yet. Yeah. And I think that's where, I mean, to, to be as frustrated as we all are with this team and then to look at them and say, man, they're just two games out. I mean, yeah. You know, the Twins are nothing special. Cleveland's nothing special. It just feels like, again, if you don't win this division, then you've really failed. And look, like, let's just kind of talk about the elephant in the room. I mean, I do think that as a fan, the La Russa thing is frustrating. And I'm not asking you to opine on it necessarily. I understand maybe it puts you in a difficult spot. But any other franchise would have shaken it up at this point by firing their manager. I mean, it just would have happened. And, and so the fact that they haven't, and that you know as a fan that that's kind of off the table, that that's really not – that's not going to happen. Like maybe he would step away, although I certainly have no sense that he would. But I think that's frustrating too, is that you're just not in a position – it just feels like you kind of – you handed over the reins to someone and and you kind of said, we're going to ride it out with, with this guy. And, and again, it's an unusual experiment to say the least. <laughs> someone who is at that stage of their career – and to do it with a young team that's poised to win and then to know that that's kind of what it's going to be, that's frustrating as, as a fan because it feels like you're not doing everything you can to win. Yeah. You know, I've thought about this and also thought about the trade deadline. It kind of goes along with it. Like, I know they were trying to make trades, but to just do status quo, like this has been the most status quo White Sox season I can remember. I mean, there have been times in the past, like Yonder Alonso, they just gave up on him. Like, okay, this isn't working. We're just, we're making a change, right? Yeah. Uh, there have been years where they were just like, we, we're, we're cutting this guy loose. Like they, uh, Dallas Keuchel, they, that was the one big one this year. Like, yeah, we're, we're done with Dallas Keuchel. Um, but because so much has been riding on this season for them to just kind of, eh, we'll figure it out. They'll, I mean, that's been surprising. Uh, I would love to know. I'd love to know what was going on behind the scenes with the trade deadline. Something tells me there was a, there's a lot more that was going on behind the scenes than, than them just like, yeah, we're not making any moves. Uh, I don't, it's, it just didn't work out for whatever reason, but I just, that's just not, that's not the white Sox way of doing things. Whenever, whenever, and I'm trying, I'm going back like, well, certainly since I've been doing this job and 
uh, since 04. Whenever they're in contention, they're aggressive at the deadline. And they weren't this year. I shouldn't say aggressive. They were on, they did, all you got was Dake Deekman, and they usually do more. Yeah, I mean, look, they publicly admitted, right? I mean, Rick Hahn basically said this was a failure. So, uh, I mean, you know, he, it's self-grading system. He gave himself an F. Yeah. Uh, again, I'm with you. I mean, they had to have tried to do something. I, yeah. I just can't. It just is so uncharacteristic. But it did go along with kind of this frustration of, seriously, this is it? This is what it's going to be? I mean, I, I don't know. Uh, again, I feel like I'm like a broken record. But I just I keep coming back to – how long are we going to be in this spot where we feel like we can win and, and to throw one of those seasons away and, and who knows? I mean, look, the, yeah, it was a year the Cardinals won the world series. What were they? 83 and 79 or something. Right. I mean, yeah, yeah, the yeah. nationals a few years ago, that was not a great team. Uh, it's not to say it can't happen, but um, I just haven't seen any sign to your point earlier where maybe if they'd gone on some sort of a run at some point where, yeah, they won, eight out of 10 or 10 out of 12 or whatever it is, say, well, if they could just capture what they had going in, you know, that stretch in mid June, well then, but, but there hasn't been that stretch. So yeah, I don't know. And this team was supposed to be fun, you know, especially the offense, the, the, the offense isn't fun, right? The lack of power is staggering in this day and age, right? I mean, it's just crazy how little power they have with a lineup that feels like it should have power. Exactly. I, do you know that they have the fourth? Well, it could have changed in the last 24 hours. But they have the fourth highest batting average in baseball. I did not know that. No. How stunning is that? Yeah. Like, but but they hit for well, where are they in home runs? They got to be twenty fifth in home runs, the, right? Near the bottom. Yep. Yep. They're yeah. like yeah, they're a singles hitting team. This, yeah. this is they became the Kansas City Royals. They went <laughs> they, they went from being a power hitting <laughs> offense to the Kansas City Royals last year. Okay, and how about this one? How about this one? Last year. Last year, believe it or not, they ranked fourth in walks. They were patient. You had Moncada and Grandal leading the way. This year, from like the third week of the season on, they've been buried in last place in walks. And how did and that I, happen? Yeah, I don't know. And then they, I mean, they do so many dumb things. I mean, the base running is just horrible. I mean, it's just, you just throw your hands up. Defense is so bad. But, yeah, I mean, like in this day, like Grandal is a great – obviously, Grandal last year was this crazy story of a walk machine. I know he's been hurt this year and out of a mess. I mean, he's just not good. <laughs> it just isn't. So, I don't know, man. I, I don't know. I I, I I will say this, and and so this is where it's different for me, right, covering 14 teams. Yeah. We're able to just kind of move on, right? <laughs> you know, like – well, this game was bad, or this team played poorly. Let's talk about someone played well. I, I I admire you guys. I mean, you can't move on. You no. can't. Well, let's. You can't say let's talk about the Yankees, right? Like you got to talk about the White Sox, and and so I do. I admire the the job that that you guys do in the studio and that Steve and Jason do because you do. Um, you know, there there are people like me, and and people who are even far more obsessed than I am who you know every day kind of tune in to again, just kind of let our cares wash away for a little while and, and watch this team. And, and unfortunately it hasn't been all that relaxing, but, but I think you guys have done a really good job of kind of keeping it going and, and trying to, to find the positive here. Yeah. I can't pivot. I have, I have to base You have nowhere to pivot. Yeah. No, no. I, uh, I have to be right in the middle of uh, the road. And if that means I'm roadkill, then uh, that's, that's what I have to be. And that's yeah. okay. I, I wear a lot of losses. It's okay. And we, we've gotten to the point now where uh, Ozzy is my therapist. We did this segment last weekend where uh, it's Dr. Ozzy, and I'm lying down on the couch, and he's uh, helping me through uh, my White Sox emotions <laughs> on the air. Uh, that's that's where it's that's where it's at right now. Uh, you I know did what? not see that. I will oh, have to look that it. up. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'll, 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 check, I'll text you. Send it to me. Yes, yes. I'll send it to you. And Ozzy, I'm a, honestly, Ozzy would make a good therapist. You're going to, you'll be impressed to hear what he says to me. Although you know, I'm married to a therapist. So uh, yes, yeah, she's got her hands full with me, but, uh, but I'll, maybe I'll, I'll let Michelle give Ozzy some notes on his, she, he can be, uh, you know, you, you have someone who helps you with your cases when you're a therapist, you can kind of bounce ideas off of. So maybe uh, Michelle can do that for Ozzy. Yeah. I think that'd be a good idea. Uh, pivoting ourselves, I want to know a little more about your White Sox fandom. Uh, most, I shouldn't say most, best obscure White Sox player 
if you had to choose one, like if you were to buy a jersey of a White Sox player from your past, but not like the obvious ones, who would it be? Oh man, how does one dis- how does one define obscure? I mean, there have been so many, right? I mean, so I, I may rest in peace, but my uh, my my name in Spanish class was Francisco after Francisco Barrios. Wow. Uh, yeah, I was a big fan of his. Um, that's that's a deep cut from the sense. It's a deep cut. I mean, you know, like Bob, Bill Maharadney, Niles Nyman. I mean, I can go through, right? Like, I love Chet Lemon. I think Chet Lemon was probably my first Me too. favorite player. Although the first year that I, that I went to games um, was, you know, 75. I mean, you know, that team had uh, Bucky Dent. Uh, Rich Gossage was on that team. I mean, they had some, they had some pretty good players. George Orta. I love George Orta. Uh, Ralph Gar. Yeah, uh, I mean, I, you know, like, I go, I go pretty deep, but I would say like my first favorite player was Chet Lemon, and and while he was a good player in his time, I, I think he probably is uh, is reasonably obscure in the the annals of baseball overall. So I might go with Chet. Yeah, I've brought up Chet Lemon about a thousand times on the podcast because he was my favorite player as well. Yeah. Uh, little did you know, or I know, that he was league average. <laughs> really. He yeah, was. He, he he was not a good. He was a good player. He was a good yeah. uh, player on a very mediocre team. Oh, and they were bad. They so were bad. But old number forty four. They were on channel forty four. He yes. was number forty four. The jersey hanging out. I loved him. Yeah, he stood out because the rest of the team was very bad. <laughs> so, like, who's this guy? And we were watching on a grainy TV station, and and so here was Chet Lemon. Chet Lemon yeah. was high def. Everyone else was grainy channel 44. So he yeah. stood out. Um, yeah. And I, actually, one of the highlights of my career was going to Sox Fest in like 2008 and getting to interview him. And that that was like, that like ranks up there with like you, being able to like talk to Frank Thomas, believe it or not. That's how much I thought of Chet Lemon. So I, yeah, I, I love Chet Lemon. I loved Harold, as you and I have discussed. Yeah. Yes. Uh, you were kind enough to introduce me to, to Harold. We had uh, we were sitting in those seats, my buddy's seats at Wrigley Field. Yep. The Cubs Sox series. I brought Meredith and uh, and and you brought Harold over. And I was like, you know, I, I mean, I, you think about all the famous people that, that we have met. Right. I mean, we're so fortunate enough to so fortunate to work in this business. And I mean, I go down the list. Right. It's crazy. But. But I was awestruck meeting Harold Bates, and I, I think he knew I was too. He, he, he milked it a little bit. <laughs> I do. I remember that. I totally remember that. Yeah, yeah. So um, we met at ESPN. You came from Sherman, Texas, right? Well, I was in the Quad Cities. So I went Sherman, Texas. I made the huge leap to the Quad Cities. Market eighty eight. I was there for one year, and then I went to ESPN. So two years, Sherman, Texas. One year, the Quad Cities. You made the biggest jump, I think, of anyone from from Traverse City, market size wise, right? Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, I think it was one nineteen. Like if if I was a uh, prospect, yeah. And this is this is going to sound like I'm bragging, but no, 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 no. I'm not bragging. I'm just letting you know. If I was a prospect, I would have been coming from like Winston Salem or Kannapolis to the big leagues. Yeah, you were in you were in the short season league in Helena. <laughs> yes, <laughs> and. Uh, <laughs> Uh, all these years later, was I ready? Hell no. Hell no. Yeah. yeah. I don't know that any of us, I mean, that's the whole thing, right? I mean, it was, that was crazy. And that is worth, I mean, you want to talk about a great podcast, the early days of ESPN news. Like if we could have four or five of us on telling those stories. Oh yeah. Oh my goodness. I mean, it was a free for all, right? Nobody knew what they were doing. It was sink or swim. And uh, man, it was, it was crazy in hindsight yeah because we went from all doing two to three minute sports casts a night maybe four minutes five on the weekends to okay you're gonna solo anchor a three-hour show five days a week and do that and then oh by the way uh let's bring in espn2 and their viewers now kiss off espn2 oh now the main channel is coming on so you gotta like fill on espn and someone like myself who'd been on television for a year in Traverse City, my brain almost exploded. So <laughs> it, it was <laughs> it was crazy. The story I love to tell is so you did a lot of the that one to four shift. Yes. And then do you remember the day where for some reason there was no one to do the four to seven and you had to do all six hours and you had to shave in the middle of that? 
Okay, Dave, Dave, you asked me that question like I don't remember. Um, I have the record. There has to be the record that will never be broken at ESPN. I was on the set by myself yeah. from 1 p.m. until 8 p.m. It was 1 to 8. Wow. Yeah, because sometimes, remember that 4 o'clock shift would sometimes go from to 7.30, sometimes it would go to 8. This one went yeah, to 8. Yeah, um, You were on longer than Jerry Lewis, Chuck. And it wasn't good TV. I can promise you that. It was the Jerry Lewis telethon. So, you know, hey, it worked for him. No, it was. Uh, but you know what? The, the guy who was uh, a natural from the beginning, it was Mike Greenberg. Like you knew Mike. Mike was effortless, made it look effortless. And it wasn't right. Would you agree with that? Well, I think that Greeny really benefited somewhat from his background in radio. Yeah. Right. I, I do think because you you really. Yeah. I mean, he was great. He stood out. I would agree. He stood out from from the very beginning. I think that was part of it. I, I think that a radio background really helped in a situation like that because there was so much ad living. I mean, I think about what I know you did in Traverse City and what I did in, in Sherman and the Quad Cities. As you said, it was like a four minute sports cast. And, and at mine was heavily scripted. Right. Like down to watching every highlight like six times to work on timing of you know, what I wanted to say and my little snide remarks and all that kind of stuff. And you just weren't able to do that at, at, on ESPN News. I mean, you're, you know, you're, as you're saying, you're just trying not to drown out there, metaphorically speaking. Yeah, so, they yeah I, do so think, uh, I, I do think his, his radio background helped him. They were, throwing us, they were throwing us shot sheets of college basketball games, hockey, okay, pronunciation, that's can be that can be a challenge. And you were reading them cold on the air, time yeah. after time after time. It was a great breeding ground. I mean, basically put me in a position where I can essentially deal with almost anything on television and get out of it just because of that. Would you agree with that? Was that what you found too? Yeah, for sure. I mean, it's interesting. I think about it a lot in terms of we saw so many things in those first years that there's, I mean, you know, down to like the lights going out. I mean, you know, pretty much everything that could possibly go wrong went wrong there. And, uh, you know, the blooper reel was exceptional. Um, I, I, feel like I, had, I, I feel like I had a disproportionate role in it. Yeah, you're, in, you're in a lot of those, actually. It's on, it's on YouTube if anyone wants to find it. I was, yeah, yeah. Um, but, yeah, I mean, so, you know, a lot went wrong. I, I think it was funny to think, like, in that first – month i calculated that i was on more on television more and i know you're saying you were saying the same thing you'd only been on for a year i've been on for three years and yet in the first month i was on tv more my first month at espn news than i have been my whole career combined uh i might say for me and i'm not uh saying what i'm not trying to diminish your statistic your ratio i would say that i was on tv more in the first week <laughs> yeah than I was in my entire career. It's yeah. insane. I don't know. You know, God bless ESPN for somehow believing in me because I was I was overwhelmed by what they were asking us to do because no one had ever done that before. Like the people on, I mean, Amber, and, and I'll, I'll move on to something else. I want one last thing. How about what Mike Tirico did? And I'm not name dropping here. I just want everyone to understand what ESPN News was at that time. When Mike Tirico came back, I, think, I don't know if you remember the story. And he, he was like a god to all of us. And when yeah. he was off the road, he was like doing golf or something like that. He said he wanted to do ESPN News because he thought that was the toughest thing to do in the building. Yeah. I mean, there's no one smoother than Mike. Mike's been instrumental in my career in a lot of ways and, and someone I really admire. Um, I remember that story. Like, I remember him asking to do a shift just to get a sense of, of what we were dealing with and being really complimentary afterward um yeah i mean there's some guys right like guys like Tarico and fowler and ravage right those guys were used to kind of baseball tonight and and you know half times and post games and all that that those guys did were the closest thing you had to espn news yeah that's a good point and we were all minor leaguers <laughs> yes yeah. yeah wearing it on the air uh I want to wrap things up with um, Big Ten stuff because obviously that's your job, and I'm yeah. in this. So you have this amazing book. It's a New York Times bestseller. 
It's called The Opening Kickoff, The Tumultuous Birth of a Football Nation. Uh, Dave, what would the founding fathers think of USC and UCLA joining the Big Ten? Well, I, I, what I want to talk about is the fact that the value of your USC degree has increased exponentially, Chuck. Has now it increased or decreased? Hold on a oh, second. increased. I mean, you finally got a degree from a real conference. My goodness, right? I mean, uh, that's amazing, right? I mean, holy cow, your earning power just went through the roof. Um, I, I don't know. I, You know, it's, it is fascinating. So, yes, I mean, I wrote in my, in my book, I wrote a lot about the early days of the Big Ten, um, because the, the central figure in my book played at the University of Wisconsin. I write a lot about the University of Chicago, which was far and away the most powerful school in the Big Ten in the early days, which is hard to believe. But yeah, you know, the, the Big Ten was really founded on eligibility. That was kind of the notion of who should be eligible to play these games, because who was to say you had to be a student or who was to say you couldn't have been enrolled the day before? I mean, there were no rules. It was literally the Wild West. And, and so obviously it was done regionally back then because that's what travel was. But but really, it was much more about kind of codifying rules for the game than it was kind of about, you know, obviously there was no television. There was no radio. There, it, it wasn't necessarily about kind of this this conglomeration of schools going out to the marketplace or anything like that. So I think they would have been absolutely floored by what it's become. Although kind of the theme of my book is that everything that's happening today kind of has its antecedents in those very early days between like 1890 and 1915. You see the beginnings of everything that the big time college athletics have become. Um, I, I mean, I'd say like, Chuck, go back to 10 years ago. What would you have said to USC and UCLA in the, in the Big Ten. I mean, just the amount of change that we have seen here in this last handful of years, I mean, I really think exceeds what had happened maybe in the previous quarter century combined. I mean, this is the time of greatest change that I've ever seen in college athletics. It, it boggles my mind. Yeah, it's massive disruption. And where do you think it goes? How many more schools are going to join the Big Ten? What do you think? I really don't know. I think that Notre Dame is is kind of the big biggest fish that's left out there. It's no secret the Big Ten has in the past invited Notre Dame. So I'm, I'm not revealing anything that anyone who follows the enterprise doesn't know. I'm sure they'd be delighted if Notre Dame wanted to join. Um, and then from there, I don't know. I mean, I think then you're kind of doing a, a math problem and you're essentially saying, does any school that you add, you've got to divide up your pie right? The TV rights are, are your pie and how many ways are you going to divide it up? And does the team that you're adding add more pie than they're going to consume? I mean, that's really what it comes down to. And so what programs out there would add more pie? I mean, I don't know. I don't really know the, the math of it all. It was clear that Texas and Oklahoma were schools that from the SEC's point of view, add more pie. I think it's clear that USC and UCLA from the Big Ten's point of view, no doubt, add more pie. Notre Dame would. Beyond that, I really don't know. And and so it's quite possible that nothing happens here, that maybe it just kind of settles in. I, I guess just the thing in the back of my mind is when you have an earthquake, when you have, you use the word disruption, and I think that that's, that's a really good word for it, but, but every earthquake has aftershocks. And so while I do think that I don't know that there are other schools out there that would add more, I still feel like it It just seems unlikely that that it's done here. Now, maybe the Big Ten's done, but maybe the aftershocks are felt in a different conference. I, I don't know. I'm a million miles away from this, other than being a USC grad. It feels like the obvious additions would be Cal and Stanford, just because you're keeping USC, UCLA, and those rivalries. You add academically, if this is anything about academics, Stanford into the mix, you got Stanford and Northwestern. Uh, that would be obvious to me. Um, and then Oregon and maybe Washington. But this is, again, me without any information, just living in a Big Ten environment and someone who went to school and knows what the Pac-10 is all about. But would that be a possibility, you think? I mean... That's those are names that you hear. I mean, Stanford is the best overall athletic de department in the country. Um, do they have a passionate fan base? Do they drive viewership? No. You know, I don't know. Do they have prestige? 
Do they have prestige? Yes. It, yeah. it might be the best university in the world. Like, yes. there's, cer- there's certainly an argument to be made for that. Yeah, they're not so, traveling to Penn State, though, to go to a football game. Well, no, their fans aren't, right. But but then does that matter? And kind of, well, what, what, it, what is it, you know, what is it about? I mean, at it, it, its core, you know, you are talking about television. And and again, those TV dollars and kind of how you divide those up. But but I agree, like part of what the Big Ten has always been about is, you know, you hear about this term AAU institutions, which is a, an umbrella organization for research-based institutions. The Big Ten has always added institutions that were in the AAU. Obviously, USC and UCLA are fabulous schools. So there's kind of fit broad-based research institutions with with athletic programs that run the gamut. I mean, that's where the Big Ten is different from some other leagues. They're very devoted to Olympic sports. USC and UCLA are fabulous there. Stanford is the creme de la creme of that. I, you know, so yes, I mean, I think there's a compelling argument to be made for those. Oregon certainly brings a lot of cachet. Washington is a fabulous school um, that, that has had a lot of success. So, I mean, once you've kind of gotten out of this mindset of it has to be contiguous states, like now we've blown up that part of the expansion model. Now you can go anywhere you want. And, and those are certainly really great programs, no doubt. All right, so University of Hawaii, let's join them. <laughs> that one I'd like for the preseason tour, for sure. Yeah. But your preseason tour, I mean, it's going to be extensive in the future. You're all going to get, you've added California schools. We might have to start in May. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, if you guys ever need a USC, a guest USC correspondent on a show, uh, I'm your guy. I will come on as a, uh, a totally biased, subjective <laughs> uh, whack when it comes to talking about usc football but uh, they're gonna be good man that lincoln riley hire is off the charts huh oh. yeah that's the thing like when we need well i shouldn't say when we need a usc head coach because some of the coaches haven't been the greatest hires we needed this this was uh, it was time like we're not messing around anymore hopefully so uh it's i don't know i, I feel you know i don't want to make this a usc podcast sorry I, i'm just i'm gonna stop i'm gonna stop yeah <laughs> Because no one wants to hear about my USC angst. They want to hear about my White Sox angst. So I'll, I'll just keep it at that. <laughs> so uh, I try to I try to keep that very, very uh, inside. Amongst yeah. my friends, not not on the podcast. But uh, um, I, uh, I I but b- back to the White Sox and we'll wrap up. Um, I do hope that uh, we have a better October than we have had uh, in recent uh, years. Uh, th- it's it's theirs for the taking. I think it comes down to this. Very simply, if the White Sox win the division, it'll be because of their offense waking up. If they lose the division, it'll be because the offense doesn't wake up and it'll be more of the same. That's my, if I'm to simplify where the White Sox are and what it's going to take this year, it's offense or bust. If they have an offense, they're winning the division. If they don't, we'll see you next year. Yeah, I'm with you. I mean, I, I think that's been the most disappointing thing. That batting average number you gave me was was really interesting. But I guess, again, that's kind of where and not, not that we weren't aware of power 20 years ago or even 10 years ago. But I think that's where our thinking about baseball has really evolved. Right. And kind of the way that, that you view a good offensive team. They're not a good offensive team right now, uh, you know, despite whatever the batting average numbers might be. And I'm with you if they can start if guys can start living up to kind of who they are. Then, then I feel like is the sky the limit? I'm not sure it is. I mean, I I think there's some a couple of pretty good no, teams. Yeah, yeah, they're they're not yeah. going to the sky. They they can go to a top of a skyscraper. <laughs> yes, exactly. <laughs> there's a limit there. There's a ceiling. <laughs> That's just what we've seen. Um, and if they would have added at the deadline some big moves, and I kind of kind kind of was thinking this, and this is you know, and I don't know what was going on behind the scenes with trades and offers and what people were giving up, but are you going to empty out your farm system? Uh, empty out. That's the wrong way to put it. Are you going to give up something from your farm system of value for a rental for this team where they're at right now? Would you do that? No, see, I wouldn't. And I think I that's why I was a little torn because yeah, you know, to me, well, they don't seem to have a lot in the farm system. Again, that's where, you know, a lot more than I do. They have more than what meets the eye. Okay. But you certainly weren't going to get in like the Soto sweepstakes, right? Well, I was I mean, like, go for it. I don't care. <laughs> but I'm just saying, that- you, you tell me, I didn't feel like they had anything. And like, well, you were going to have to give up current major leaguers, clearly. Yes, yes, yes. Yeah. Yes, done that. Yeah. 
they probably I don't know. Really, there wouldn't I, have been. I, a I, I don't know. It's it is frustrating to see where where they are, but but I'm like you. I'm gonna I'm I'm gonna hope until they're eliminated. <laughs> yeah, there we <laughs> until, go. Until the 27th out of the last game of the year, I'm I'm going to have hope, but but I'll be uh, you know I'll be exasperated when it doesn't work out because this yeah. is a team I was really looking forward to watching. Everyone, don't give up on the White Sox. You can. It's fine. You can turn the channel. But uh, what else are you going to do <laughs> with your time? Spend three hours a day with the White Sox. Why not? There you go. Or just, yeah. or, you know, or just watch the postgame show with me and Ozzy. We have a good time whether they win or lose. So, uh, Dave Revson, thank you so much. Uh, it's been great. Been great catching up with you. We'll have to play some golf when you – well, you know, that's over. We, you're, 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 you can't play golf the rest of the year, can you? Yeah, maybe one or two rounds I'll sneak in. Okay. We'll figure out a way. All right, we'll figure out a way. Uh, it's been great catching up. You do amazing work with the Big Ten Network, and uh, I look forward to uh, USC versus Northwestern. And some- <laughs> I, I still, you know, we, we there was one famous USC Northwestern game in yes. our lifetimes. Yes, and and I would just say replays confirm Brian Musso's knee was down on that critical punt return fumble touchdown. I think the game might have ended a little differently. And we've been in the I, I have no idea what you've been you're talking about, and yet you somehow are carrying this with you for the last 30 yeah. years. It does yeah, that was even, a tough one. That was a tough one for the cats. It was it was a great one for the USC Trojans. Okay. All right, that's a wrap for this edition of the White Sox Talk Podcast, brought to you by Wintrust, your home for White Sox checking with free ATMs nationwide. Go to their special White Sox webpage is ww.wintrust.com slash socks. Uh Dave, one of the highlights for me is being able to wrap up every podcast with this. Hawk Harrelson. Take it away. Thanks, our Chuck. And this edition of the White Sox Talk Podcast is over.